junk fees. It really seems like companies have become addicted to junk fees. And it's making companies billions of dollars richer. Tipping culture has gotten out of control. There are people who argue 20% is kind of a cheap tip. People like free shipping because the word free is very powerful. It's not really free because someone is paying for it. You're being guilted into tipping on something that is not technically a service. Someone's simply doing their job. When was the last time you purchased something and you weren't asked for a tip? Yeah, I can't remember either. Tipping culture has gotten out of control. I get up to the pay window and she's like, how much do you want to tip? What am I going to tip you for? I'm in the drive through Oh my God. Tips have been on the rise for decades. During the 1950s, people commonly tipped 10% of the bill. By the 1970s and 1980s, that jumped to 15%. Today, people tip anywhere from 15 to 25 percent. According to one 2022 survey, consumers said they tipped more than 21 percent on average. Nowadays, there are people who argue 20 percent is kind of a cheap tip. While the percentage that consumers are tipping at full-service restaurants in the past couple of years has remained about the same, in the fourth quarter of 2022, the number of tips provided at full-service restaurants grew 17 percent. Meanwhile, the tip frequency at quick service restaurants such as coffee shops and fast food chains rose 16% during the same time period. What we're seeing now nationwide is something that is known as tipflation. At every opportunity, we're being presented with a tablet that's asking us how much we'd like to tip. In many cases, not only replacing the old fashioned tip jars that you could feel good about throwing some spare change into, but actually suggesting tip amounts, often right in front of the employee receiving that tip. Not to mention also your dinner date and the dozen or so people standing behind you in line. And it's gone beyond just the tablets. The other day I was using the Hopper app to book a hotel and it wasn't until I confirmed my payment that I realized my hotel was $10 more expensive. It turns out Hopper assumed I wanted to add a tip and I had to go back to a prior page in order to opt out. Tipflation refers to not just that we're tipping more, but we're tipping everyone for everything. You're being guilted into tipping on something that is not technically a service. It's someone simply doing their job. In those situations, consumers are feeling resentful. Where do you draw the line? TIP stands for to ensure promptness. Tipping may go back as far as the Roman era, but according to most experts, the practice likely has its origins in medieval Europe. Noblemen taking passage on roads would throw coins to the rubble to ensure safe passage. One theory is that it evolved in eating and drinking establishments as a way to forestall envy, that when you're eating and drinking, you're having fun, and the people who are serving you are not. Fast forward to the 19th century, when waiters who received a full wage went on strike demanding higher wages, they were replaced with women who employers could pay less. A decade later, there was the population of newly freed slaves. The idea from these restaurant owners was that they were giving the luxury or privilege of a white person's tips. That was without a full wage. Ironically, as tipping exploded in the United States, it became less common in Europe and was replaced with service charges. While the first federal minimum wage law was passed in 1938, it wasn't until almost three decades later when the tip minimum wage was established. In 1991, the federal minimum wage for tipped employees was set at $2.13, which is what it remains at as of March 2023. As far as I know, the United States is the only country that exempts tipped workers from having to receive the full minimum wage. In 43 states, it is legal to pay tipped workers less than the standard minimum wage because tips presumably make up that difference. In recent years, you might have found yourself asking, do I tip this barista for pouring that hot coffee? What about when I'm going to a restaurant and picking up takeout? And how much do I tip that doorman, driver, or dog walker? 
When those in the service industry were feeling the brunt during the coronavirus pandemic, consumers started tipping for things they never had before. And the percentage of remote transactions when tipping was an option in which the consumer tipped soared from about 46% before the pandemic to around 86% in January 2022. If people were willing to tip the person delivering food to their home 30%, why not ask if they'd like to tip when they come pick up? During the pandemic, businesses who lost a lot of traditional customers and transactions were looking for alternative ways to make up that income. And if asking for tips was one way to do it, they were willing to try it. And since then, that ask hasn't dissipated. Another reason consumers say they feel pressured to tip more? They're being asked to tip prior to service completion. Asking for a tip beforehand is almost like a bribe, right? It's, I'm afraid not to tip because, well, you do less good work. Customers might not be concerned about the barista's perception of their tip before getting their latte, but what about the mechanic repairing your car? I don't know about you, but I'm certainly going to make sure to tip them well to ensure my safety. Another reason consumers are tipping more? Newer technologies. Kiosks and tablets with three large tipping suggestions that pop up on the screen in front of you. Three options chosen by the business. I have not yet been to the restaurant where they recommend 5, 10, or 15% for quick takeout. It normally always starts at 15 as a bare minimum, sometimes even starting at 20, 25, and up to 30. According to a 2022 creditcards.com survey, 22% of respondents said when they're presented with various suggested tip amounts, they feel pressured to tip more than they normally would. They use those options as an indication of kind of what the normative range is and feel compelled to tip within that range. So the more you ask, the more you get. The three prominent companies with that trendy, sleek look are Square, Toast, and Clover. They launched a bit more than a decade ago to help businesses run smarter, faster, and easier, all in one point of sale or POS systems. In some cases, fewer fees so it's less of a burden to accept multiple credit cards, no long-term contracts, and multiple other useful tools, including inventory and employee management. They got credit card processing into the hands of individuals and very small merchants. Square did a great job. It's been a tremendous growth story. That's half of the business today. Do you think these companies are responsible for this turn of events that we've seen with tipping? I would say they could take some of the credit for helping restaurants gather more tips. Robert Sanchez manages Eli's Essentials in New York City. One of the business's locations uses Toast, while the other uses this. He says the storefront that uses Toast sees more and higher tips. The Clover Square and Toast terminals to a consumer are very easy to use. Big buttons, big areas to sign the tip, an easy way to tip a different amount if you don't like the starting at 20% option. There are others that do it, they're just not as uh, cool looking. We've come a long way from being able to just throw your spare change into the jar by the cash register. The new tablets have turned what used to be a sin of omission, I simply didn't put money into the tip jar, into a sin of commission. I have to hit a button and say no tip. I have to actively choose not to tip, whereas before, not tipping was a kind of a passive thing. Glancing at the tip jar could have also been a way to get a sense of how many others are tipping on that service and maybe even how much money. Meanwhile, not only can the tipping options be customized, but the tipping feature can be disabled as well. So it's the merchant's choice to ask or not to ask for tips. From the business side, it makes employees want to perform better and do a better job. It's seriously significant. It really pays for the software. You'd be a foolish business owner not to install it based on what the numbers display. Even a mammoth company as large as Starbucks has decided that they need to sink or swim, and, and the best way for them to do that is, is to offer the tip screen. Starbucks rolled out the tipping feature in stores in September 2022. It's one thing to have a happy staff. It's another thing to have customers that are feeling resentful. I think it's a calculus that all business owners really need to make.
do you think that they're somewhat going to start seeing that they're getting lower tips because people are paying tips to so many services or they're resentful of the act of tipping in general? I think that's a very real danger of servers in a sit-down restaurant. They were greatly affected during and immediately post-pandemic by restaurants doing all sorts of fees. Their tips were actually going down because consumers were saying, well, if I'm paying for the health insurance and I'm paying for inflation and I'm paying for this and I'm paying for that, enough is enough. The more you levy these line items onto consumers, guess who's being penalized? It's the one area that's still quasi-discretionary, which is the tip. I went door to door talking with waitresses, bartenders, and baristas, and while they wanted to remain anonymous, they told me it's happening already. With inflation and being prompted for tips left and right, they say customers have already started to tip less and sometimes not at all. A 2022 study found that 17% of Americans are tipping less because of inflation. However, 10% report tipping more. At the same time, more than half of Americans, or 60%, want to do away with tipping entirely. The extent of pandemic-influenced generosity has also gone down. 43% of consumers typically tipped servers 20% or more in 2022, compared to 56% of consumers in 2021. Meanwhile, the average tip for full-service restaurants has gone down only slightly during the same time period. According to Toast, 19.6% in the fourth quarter of 2022, compared to 19.8%, in 2021. However, according to surveys conducted in those same years, respondents said they're tipping higher percentages, 21.2% and 18.9% respectively. It can genuinely hurt the people who truly, truly rely on gratuities for their livelihood. I firmly believe that the tipping invasion we're experiencing right now, I think it's a net negative for society. And with that tablet at just about every counter, no matter where you go, the question is, where's the tipping point? I'm wondering how long before I'm tipping my doctor after an annual physical. If you want to seem especially generous after an exceptional meal, you might decide to go big and tip 30%. But it's a cycle. As more people seeking to make a good impression then up their tips to 30%, maybe even 35%, what becomes a generous tip? I have to believe tips are going to go up from where they are today. But I also think there's got to be a logical ceiling somewhere. I just don't know where it is. Nearly $65 billion. That's how much money is lost to this deceptive American practice. Junk fees. We're tired of being played for suckers. This really seems like companies have become addicted to junk fees. And it's making companies billions of dollars richer across industries spanning banking and telecom to entertainment and hospitality. I stayed at a hotel. I asked, are there any extra fees? They said no. The bill on the last night, we were charged a $40 a night amenity fee, but even crazier, a $1 mandatory charity donation. I looked up the charity. It's a charity that goes back to the hotel. These fees are more than just annoying. The White House says they weaken market competition, raise costs, and ultimately drain the wallets of Americans. The very entity that's creating these fees are the ones telling you, well, we have to charge them. Their investors and shareholders really like it. It's another way to pull in more revenue without really competing, unless we do something about it. It's just a race to the bottom. Some changes are happening. But the question remains whether any of the new policies and regulatory oversight will actually be enough to squash junk fees once and for all. Junk fees are basically an additional cost that has little to no added value. It's a junk fee, you know? Junk fees are fees that sometimes provide no service whatsoever and are not subject to the normal forces of competition. There are so many different kinds of these hidden fees. So let's categorize some of the biggest offenders into three different buckets. Bucket number one, 
banking fees, like overdraft charges, late fees, or fees to pay a bill, or even account maintenance fees that you might get hit with after easily signing up for a new bank account, a charge for using that service every year. We could even count student loans in this bucket. Just before the pandemic, we found that banks charged about 15 and a half billion dollars in overdraft fees in just one year. And many of those fees were ones that actually could not have been avoided. It, it isn't just unfair in many cases, it's illegal. And banks are cashing in. Fees worth nearly $24 billion were charged by card issuers in 2019. And most of that, $14 billion, came from late fees alone. We estimate that the credit card industry levies about $120 billion in fees and interest each year. And that number might be even going up given the rise in interest rates. Bucket number two, fun fees, or the fees that you might incur when you're hopefully doing something fun, like buying a concert ticket, booking a flight, or a hotel. For example, resort fees might be added for your use of amenities during your stay, even if you're not using the gym or the pool, and even if it's not a resort. Junk hotel fees and these ancillary fees at hotels bring in about $3 billion a year for the hotel industry. Waikiki has them in Detroit, which is crazy. Lauren Wolf founded Kill Resort Fees in 2016 after a vacation in Florida. Even though my receipt said paid in full, I couldn't get the key to the room unless I paid an extra $20 in the name of a resort fee. And so I started the website. Hotel or resort fees can be anywhere from $20 to $70 per night. Many sites don't display these extra costs in the advertised price, so people can't comparison shop. The same thing happens when you buy a plane ticket. A lot of times people don't realize they're booking the lowest economy fare that doesn't allow them to bring a suitcase. The same goes for entertainment fees. It's when you try to buy a ticket to go see Taylor Swift. No price gouging! Off the record, my wife calls me a Gen X Swifty. Are you sure you want that off the record? <laughs> I do not mind. I have a very comfortable place in my life. I love Taylor Swift. For your band to make six bucks out of a $42 ticket price, yeah, that doesn't feel good. Doesn't strike me the Government Accountability Office found that, on average, ticketing companies charged fees worth about 27% of the ticket's face value. And then bucket number three, home fees. From buying a house to having a car and getting internet at home. This includes closing costs and other fees that come up when you're trying to buy a home, like extra fees for document preparation or title insurance. Then there's your cable and internet junk fees a multi-billion dollars in revenue for the cable companies to keep breaking out these fees, and they're mandatory. Including CNBC's own parent company, Comcast. The cable, internet, and cell phone companies can charge you 200 or more if you decide to switch to another provider. Give me a break. It can also be a violation of marketing. So if you look at the fine print, they're like to maintain our high-speed fiber network, and you're like, okay, so you have to charge me an extra seven bucks for the internet infrastructure fee, but what about the $75 I've already paid you? What's that pain? Today's actions are gonna save consumers more than $1 billion each year. And that's a lot of money. President Biden has been asking agencies to tackle this problem. And regulators have the ability to address junk fees today using existing authorities. It's really an all-of-government effort. The FTC has a law prohibiting unfair or deceptive practices, and so we already have the ability to bring lawsuits against junk fees. Uh, we can make it even clearer for companies, and we can also strengthen our ability to impose civil penalties on companies that are imposing junk fees and also get back money for consumers. The CFPB is targeting overdraft and bounce check fees and issued further guidance for banning surprise overdraft charges. The White House estimates these moves alone will reduce fees by more than $1 billion each year. We anticipate that the amount of annual overdraft fees has declined by billions of dollars per year. We have done major enforcement actions when it comes to junk fees against Wells Fargo, Regions Bank, and others. The agency also wants to change credit card late fees to $8. It could save Americans as much as $9 billion a year in late fees. 
No, we don't think credit card companies should build their business model based on these fees. And the Department of Transportation wants to require companies to show the full price of a plane ticket at booking, baggage fees and all. I know how unfair it feels when a company overcharges you and gets away with it. Not anymore. We've written a bill to stop it all. President Biden still wants Congress to pass the Junk Fee Prevention Act in hopes of tackling four more hidden charges. One, to ban airline fees for families to sit with small children. Baggage fees are bad enough. Airlines can't treat your child like a piece of baggage. Two, excessive concert, event, and entertainment fees. Three, crack down on early termination fees for canceling telecom services. And four, getting rid of the surprise vacation charges like resort and destination fees. You know, we've met with the FTC and we've seen these fees get a bit more transparent. Though I hesitate to say that, you know, transparency here is gonna solve anything. Part of the problem is drawing the line between what is truly junk and what charges are warranted. One dissenting FTC commissioner, Christine Wilson, called junk fees flawed assumptions and vague definitions. The Peterson Institute for International Economics argues that the projected savings is speculative arithmetic, that at best spotlights $27 billion in junk fees. And those figures may not accurately represent how those junk fees, if they're eliminated, how they can be rolled into that upfront cost. They also estimate that the real savings of junk fees could work out to be $100 average annually for each 131 million American households, which would be much less than President Biden's estimate of hundreds of dollars per month per American. They add up to hundreds of dollars a month. Dissenting FTC Commissioner Wilson poses the question of whether government-mandated all-in pricing will actually result in less price competition or whether it could make consumers pay for goods and services they may not want or need. What would your response be to someone who thinks that the junk fee is something that is beneficial? I think the first thing is you should give consumers a choice. Oftentimes these types of junk fees are tacked on in a way where it's all or nothing and so there's no way for the consumer to actually buy the product or service without being subject to the junk fee in the first place. I think if these fees are being included you really have to make the case to the consumer or to the member of the public about what they're really buying through paying this fee in the first place. Some House Republicans point to how late fees are used to offset costs for credit and financial products, arguing that the CFPB's proposal to crack down on credit card late fees would result in negative consequences because credit providers like banks would be forced to increase interest rates for all borrowers in order to offset that lost income. That could lead banks to restrict credit to lower income customers who are more likely to overdraw their accounts in the first place. However, PIIE believes that the Junk Fee Prevention Act is likely not to pass through the House of Representatives' Republican majority. So we're now considering whether to introduce a rule that would apply across the economy and put companies on notice that these types of junk fees can be illegal. We also more generally are inviting comment right now on whether the FTC should do a rule that addresses junk fees more broadly. So this would not just be focused on a particular sector, but really zooming out and looking across the board. Some practices are shifting. A lot of banks are already starting to eliminate these fees. 15 of the 20 largest banks agreed to stop charging bounce check fees. And the Department of Transportation dashboard resulted in more guarantees of hotels and meals for passengers that experienced delays or cancellations at the fault of the airlines, none of which was guaranteed before. I think President Biden has recognized that this is an issue that impacts everyday Americans, that this isn't just a travel issue of people going to the fanciest hotels, that this impacts hotels that are charging $40 a night. It impacts hotel workers. It impacts how taxes are collected. Just these sorts of junk fees, just hotel junk fees, are really impacting our economy at a time when we need more travel and tourism. Telecom is also prepping for new regulations. The Federal Communications Commission will have new rules for a grocery store like nutrition labels starting in 2024. Broadband providers must relay details about prices, speeds, data allowances, and any and all added fees. But it's likely that more solutions will be needed. There's currently a 50 attorneys general investigation into hotel resort fees. The Nebraska attorney general has sued Hilton. The DC attorney general has sued Marriott. 
Pennsylvania just came with to an agreement with Marriott, also about hotel resort fees. The fight against these fees is likely far from over as more congressional hearings are down the road. There's broad agreement that this fee creep across the economy has to stop. So if the FTC did end up finalizing a rule that either prohibited junk fees or added new obligations on companies when they're adding fees, it would really mean that if companies violate the rule, the FTC will be able to charge them civil penalties, which are fees that can really pile up on these companies. It would also mean that the FTC would be able to actually get money back for consumers. So the junk fees that consumers were paying would be able to get that money back in their pockets. Free shipping isn't free. This idea of free shipping has become pervasive, right? And there's a cost for that. It's just a psychological thing that people see that word free and it takes away one barrier to having them purchase, that's all. There were over 131 billion parcels shipped worldwide in 2020 and parcel shipments are expected to double again in the next five years, possibly reaching 266 billion by 2026. The big carriers like FedEx, UPS, and even Amazon are making a lot of deliveries, and none of those packages are being shipped for free. When consumers click that buy box, they often don't see the wet labor leads to a box on their doorstep. And those shipping costs are ever increasing. Anyone can offer an Amazon Prime two-day shipping, it's just the cost that you as a brand might incur in providing that service. Very rough numbers. It might cost you anywhere from $25 to $35 for a typical transaction. That's a two-day, right? That seems very expensive. People like free shipping because the word free is very powerful, even if people know that it's not really free because someone is paying for it. Here's why free shipping is a myth. answer to who's paying for it, it definitely depends. And it depends on a plethora of factors around how expensive is the particular item. As a brand or an e-commerce entrepreneur, what are my margins on that particular order? And third is how much actually for me is the cost of shipping? Oh, the seller is paying for the shipping. It just comes right down to whoever is selling. So if the customer is charged the shipping fee, the seller still pays for that label and the customer basically pays for the label through that fee. But if it says free shipping on the listing, the seller is still having to buy the label. The seller is subsidizing part of it or maybe the whole thing. I have free shipping on certain items that are lighter, like things that I can basically control and estimate how much it's going to cost. Kara has been selling her products on Etsy since 2011, and now she takes to YouTube to help other online sellers maximize their profits. I just figure out how much is it going to cost based on the size and the weight, and I either decide, well, I can eat that cost, or I'll have to add some of it into the price of the item. Etsy's free shipping initiative launched in 2019. It includes tools and support for sellers to help guarantee free shipping on orders of $35 or more for U.S. buyers. As of December 31st, 2021, 67% of sellers' items on the Etsy marketplace offered free shipping to U.S. buyers. Etsy isn't the only company helping sellers calculate shipping costs. I'm Drew. I'm one of the founders and the CEO of ShipBob. We started the business almost seven years ago now with the idea to help bring best-in-class uh, logistics for small to mid-sized e-commerce businesses. ShipBob helps these businesses coordinate their products, inventory, orders, and shipments efficiently, helping them keep up with big business like Amazon. We did a survey of merchants and close to 50 to 75% of the respondents said that they offer some sort of free shipping. Either it's blanket free shipping across the entire website or it's free shipping to the consumers after their cart hits a certain threshold of either 50 to $75. What has happened in the last couple of years is that the actual cost of shipping that UPS and the FedEx and the DHL and the USPS charge to brands has gone up because their labor wage rates have gone up because there's so much volume, they're paying a lot of overtime excess. 
etc so their cost of operating has gone up significantly which then they are passing on to companies like us which are then forced to pass on to brands that we work with delivery giants like fedex and ups both said rates would go up an average of 5.9% next year across most services. Companies like Amazon, Walmart, and Target, even Etsy, benefit from economies of scale. These big players are generating so many online sales, putting them at an advantage to achieve bulk discount rates. Most of the time, these companies will negotiate a price with the postal service. So they go to the post office and they say, we are shipping, you know, X number of packages. We're going to be buying this number of labels. And because they have so many people buying labels from Etsy shipping labels, they can negotiate the lower rates. These rates are not publicly disclosed, and Amazon, FedEx, UPS, and USPS either declined to be interviewed or did not respond for comment. However, Kara helped us break down how some of these costs may compare. Here's an example of a lightweight four ounce package going cross country. The retail rate, what you might pay at the post office, is $5.50. Kara says Etsy charges a commercial rate of $4.15 to sellers. In another example, a heavier one pound package shipping priority cross country, shipping would cost Kara $11.60 at that retail rate. But buying the shipping label through Etsy brings that shipping rate down to $9.68. Etsy told CNBC that without access to item level and logistics information, that it couldn't confirm these numbers. ShipBob negotiates bulk discounts from UPS, USPS, FedEx, and DHL for both domestic and international rates across different service levels for any customers using their platform. Amazon is a unique player in the e-commerce game for so many reasons, but one is that it's heavily invested in its own transportation and logistics business so that it could rely less on UPS and USPS. And same for Walmart and Target. Recently, they all have announced some ways that they are also getting into transportation simply because they have enough volume. In 2019, Amazon was delivering 47% of its own packages. In 2021, that number soared to 72%. Amazon's other strategy to lower shipping costs is to place warehouses of inventory to lessen the distance a package has to ultimately travel. By placing inventory strategically across maybe six to seven different locations, you can cover 90 to 95% of the US population within two days. According to ShipBob, its clients have seen that distributing inventory across several fulfillment centers can reduce shipping costs by 25% and bring a 13% cost savings to their bottom line. Not only do they get delivered faster, but UPS and FedEx charge you less for it because, you know, it doesn't have to go through their entire infrastructure. And so that's really how Amazon and the Walmarts of the world have made it possible to offer free shipping to their consumers. Despite all this, shipping is super expensive for every player in the game, even Amazon, which still primarily outsources costly rural deliveries to USPS and outsources that expensive last mile portion to small delivery contractors. What does this mean for small business? Well, it's harder to keep up. Even in the US, if I ship from the East Coast to the West Coast, it costs maybe 50% more depending on the size of the package than if I'm just shipping from the East Coast to the East Coast. So you can't really plan 100% for how much things are gonna cost when you ship them. And that makes it difficult to 100% offer free shipping because a lot of times you end up with no profit if you're not really careful. The cost of shipping goes beyond what is easily quantified. Hitting costs include exploitation of workers, lack of unions, small business closures, and the impact on the environment. Some of that labor that goes into delivering goods to your doorstep happens within warehouses and distribution facilities. And blue collar warehouse workers do a lot of backbreaking labor. Research has shown that Amazon has a very high injury rate, even higher than the industry on average, which is saying a lot because it's a rather dangerous industry in terms of workplace injuries and accidents. The interviews that we collected with warehouse workers in the Riverside and San Bernardino counties were reporting all sorts of back injuries, muscle sprains. One other group of workers who make next day shipping uh, possible are the delivery drivers, right? For example, part of Amazon's strategy was to invest in the most expensive part of the shipping process, getting a package that last mile. 
Part of this is completed by Amazon Flex drivers, which are individual gig workers who make between $18 and $25 an hour, driving routes on demand. Then there's the drivers working for Amazon's delivery service partners, aka the DSPs, which are smaller independent companies that contract with Amazon. What I think a lot of Amazon Prime members and consumers don't realize is that these workers who are delivering the goods to your doorstep on the next day or the same day do not work for Amazon. Their employers are small trucking companies that Amazon instead puts all the liability on these small firms that have, let's say, 40 vans. So instead of hiring drivers, Amazon hired small companies, and this was a key aspect in preventing unions and preventing responsibility of those workers. The DSP program started in 2018, with Amazon offering $10,000 to incentivize current Amazon employees, veterans, Black, Latinx, and Native American entrepreneurs to launch a DSP. There's now more than 2,000 DSPs in the U.S. So these workers, we can compare them to a similar job, whether it's United States Postal Service workers or UPS workers, those are both union jobs. And Amazon has now built this massive infrastructure based on these contingent workers who have far less rights, far less coverage, and if you include benefits, make less than half of what your average Teamster does per hour. The disparate impacts of warehousing and those impacts affect small businesses. As we mentioned, many of those have been under pressure closing because they can't compete. In a 2019 survey, three quarters of independent retailers said Amazon's dominance is a major threat to their survival. And then on top of that, there are environmental concerns as well, right? Warehouses often are clustered together, concentrated in certain regions like the Inland Empire, as well as neighborhoods that tend to be low-income communities of color. One study shows transport will be the biggest source of new greenhouse gas emissions in the decades until 2050. In absolute terms, Amazon is the largest emitter of greenhouse gases, with total emissions measuring over 60 million metric tons of CO2 equivalents in 2020. And the impact is that, you know, it pollutes the air, right? All those deliveries going out to deliver goods means a lot of air pollution. There's been a normalization of kind of instant consumer gratification. And what comes with that is then free shipping. Free shipping has become synonymous with that instant gratification. Offering free shipping ultimately impacts the bottom line for all retailers, not just because of the cost to ship something, but because consumers are more likely to complete a purchase if offered that free shipping. According to ShipBob, offering free shipping has proven to be the most effective website banner from a conversion standpoint. It also is a psychological thing where people see free and even if you know that someone's paying for the label and you know that you're probably paying for the label within the cost of the item, it still is one less thing that you have to plan for. On the one hand, it is good for the customer psychologically without not having to plan for it. But on the other hand, it really puts pressure on people who can't afford to ship for free. And then it takes all of our profits. Offering free two-day shipping on domestic orders showed that brands have been able to increase average amount spent per transaction by 97% and even reduce car abandonment by 18%. Many people today have low to moderate incomes, right? And even middle class families are often sort of struggling to pay all the bills. I think many consumers are trying to cut costs in different ways. I think also people don't really stop to consider what the costs are. We wanted more and more people to really sort of pause and think about what is it that we're doing in our society to each other as we consume, you know?